All right, so let's start with another chapter today for market risk, and that is the parametric approaches, which is, and here we are talking about the parameters. Yet again, the parameters will be at play. And, uh, but this, these parameters are going to be tracking the extreme values, not focusing on the central tendency and so on and so forth. But rather, the main focus is that on the extreme values. So let's go ahead and let's check it out. It's going to be an interesting chapter. Uh, people find it to be scary, but uh, it's it's very interesting. Let's let's go ahead and and we'll we'll like this thing. Okay. So first off, what is the importance and challenges of extreme values in risk management? See, what are extreme values? Extreme values are a low probability, high impact events that can be very costly and and when it comes to cost i mean financially it can have very severe con consequences and i think that's a very bad thing so that is a broadly like something that does not happen very often but the impact can be very high okay that's that's the main keyword if it does if, if it does not ha happen a lot if it's a low probability not a not a bad thing but the impact is high. If it had been a low impact, then it really does not make any difference. We really not bother about it. But the impact is so high that it can lead to the bankruptcies. And we have, we have seen this, right? So these are the extreme value. Why is it a problem? Why extreme value is considered to be a problem? See, the estimation of extreme risk poses a difficult problem due to the rarity of these events and the limited number of extreme observations available. Even for us, when it comes to data for the extreme values, that is very less. Okay, so we really cannot identify that if it had been like this much, the, the worst loss, can it go beyond or above that worst loss? We don't know. So that we have a limited number of extreme observations. And for us to make such sort of an analysis, it becomes a little bit more challenging as well. And I think that's a, that's a problem here. Because they are so rare, you really do not have much data. And then secondly, they can have significant financial consequences. As, as I said, uh, there can be some severe financial consequences. And uh, we'll see the examples here. And if you just check it out here, the unprecedented stock market fall. Like we were not expecting this. That is so unprecedented, but it just happened. And there is a stock market fall. And that is the reason, you know, if you just think about it, there has been a lot of people, a lot of companies, their, their equity has been wiped out because of these things. I think a perfect example is that of an LTCM, which we studied in level one as well. They did not have, like they, they were expecting like their overall, you know, uh, their risk measures, they were predicting somewhere here, like pretty much within three standard deviations away from this mean. But it was such an extreme that they had to face loss up to eight standard deviations, which was a rare kind of an event. But eventually, if you look at this, the significant financial consequences, the LTCM, they went bankrupt like uh, institution for so many years and they just bankrupt. The failures of major institutions, just like the LTCM, that is also an example of an extreme event. So if something happens like that, you can term it as extreme events. The outbreak of financial crisis and some natural catastrophes as well, this could also be a part of an extreme event because it can have significant consequences for a firm or a company. Now, what are the challenges of extreme events when it comes to challenges? Estimating risk associated with extreme events is challenging due to their rarity. I mean, they are so rare that you do, really do not have the data points that you can connect and you can analyze. That's one of the biggest challenge here. And estimates of extreme risk must therefore be very uncertain. So obviously, if you want to estimate the extreme risk, it's not a certain thing. It's your guess. It's your estimate. And that is the reason we call it as an uncertain event. 
remember in in part one we had that unknown in the in the chapter one in the foundations book we had something like unknown unknown something that is something that has not happened yet we don't know about it and the impact is also unknown we don't know what's going to be the impact i think this is one of the categories that it can just fall into so estimates of extreme risk must therefore be uncertain and this uncertainty is especially more pronounced it gets bigger if we are interested in extreme risk not only within a range of observed data but well beyond it and it becomes really more pronounced when you just expect that okay that within this range our losses will be no that's not the point it becomes so uncertain that within this observed range of data it goes very well above it it goes beyond it what the expectations of var or maybe the expected shortfall is so i think that's one of the challenge here the uncertainty is another factor the rarity the lack of data all these things are <clears throat> could be the factors that can really affect this particular thing okay next learning objective and it says that okay we talked about the extreme values now let's talk about the extreme value theory what do you mean by that and it's used in the risk management extreme value theories which is what the entire chapter is all about is a is a branch of applied statistics tailored to estimating risk associated with extreme events so it's a it's a statistical method that we're going to be using for understanding the extreme events and how do you estimate risk which is associated to the extreme events that's what the extreme value theory is all about now evt it actually differs from the central tendency statistics so in level 1 quants we actually focused more heavily on the central tendencies right and little bit of deviations we saw in terms of uh, skewness and kurtosis but uh, most probably we focused on central tendencies like the mean median and the mode and they if you have a data like this they pretty much focused on the center points okay uh, one one thing that is what we call as mean or the mu is known as a location parameter when i talk about a, see it's a chapter about parametric right so the first parameter that you need to understand is something known as location parameter and it just describes that what is going to be the location where will you locate the mean here maybe here or maybe here so we know that okay in a you know normal distribution it is going to be in the center so we know the location is going to be in the center right and we focus pretty much on this central tendency and we we said that okay and the second location the second was the scale parameter the the variance or the standard deviation okay this is known as a scale parameter that means how dispersed your data is like these tails that you see how dispersed they are so as i said we usually go to three standard deviations on to the left side and on to the right side the positive side as well but the dispersion for ltcm was very very high it was so dispersed that it was up to eight standard deviations but generally speaking the central tendency they are very much limited and uh, we say that okay uh, these events they rarely happen in a normal distribution so this is an example of a central tendency statistics and uh, here if you if you talk about evt we really do not care about the central tendency rather the entire focus is more on the extreme values that's this is this is the major focus of the evt okay so evt differs from central tendency as it focuses on extreme values rather than the averages central tendency pretty much focuses on the averages okay so that's that's one of the differentiator and i hope that you know what is a location parameter it finds a location a center point and then scale is the how how values are dispersed around the mean that's what we are finding here so extreme value this uh, theory uh, or distributions and their parameters are distinct okay when i talk about the mu, mu and the standard deviation for a central tendency like a normal distribution and if i compare it with the extreme value distributions they are uh, the namings are quite similar but in some aspect 
they're quite different. Okay. And they're distinct in itself. Okay. Making parameter estimation more difficult. So see, to find the mean, it's just a simple average. You do it simple. All the numbers of observations divided by N, you do it, you get a mean. But here it's pretty much a little bit more difficult. EVT uses extreme value theorems. So there are some theorems here to select the suitable distributions and estimate parameters for extreme data. Now, first thing that we need to understand is that there are more than 100 distributions that actually exist. And in this chapter, we are focusing on the extreme values distributions. What are the different distributions that apart from a normal distributions we can rely on? Okay, so this is one of the things that we have here. But the point to note is that EV, uh, EVT distributions, they're not so easy to, you know, to estimate the parameters as it happens in a central tendency statistics. And uh, it there are th some theorems, which we're going to be just talking about in the next slide to so that that theorem will help you to get a suitable distribution for the data that you have. Okay, that's what this thing talks about. So in the first step of the EVT, a large sample is taken. Now let's let's begin that how EVT actually happens. So in the very first step, a large sample is taken from an unknown distribution. Now, I really don't know what this distribution is, okay? How this distribution looks like, I really don't care about it. But this is my population data, for example. And what do I do is, I take out the samples here. I take out all the samples here. And then what's the third step? So this is my first step, I have the data. The second step is to take the samples and within the samples, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pick the extreme values. Maybe here, I'm just going to pick out what's the extreme value here. Okay. Noted. Same thing here. What's the extreme value here? Okay. Noted. S same thing here. What is the extreme value? What is the extreme values? And then what I do is the maximum value of this sample is determined. So I'm going to just determine what's the max value of these samples. And then I can just collect these samples. Okay. All these max values that I have here, I'll collect these sample values and I'll form a kind of distribution, whatever the distribution looks like. And this distribution that you will get of all the extreme values is known as generalized extreme value distribution. It's a generalized form of an extreme value distribution. I hope that you get the get the point here. So generalized is a more uh, it's it's a more general thing that that has all the extreme values distribution. And this distribution is what I call as a generalized extreme value distribution. Okay. So if we just go through it, this maximum value is considered an extreme value in a in a particular sample. And as the sample size increases, the distribution of all these extreme approaches, the generalized extreme value distribution. So GEV is a, is, is, is a, it's a tree. Okay. And it has certain distributions within itself. Okay. So which we'll, we'll talk about, but I hope that what is generalized extreme value distributions, you're clear with that. Okay. So this is what extreme value theory is and how do you use the extreme values? You're just sampling the extreme values, not the, uh, the center point, you're just, you're not considered about the central tendency. If, if you, if you take a sample, we are least bothered about the central tendency data. We are just focused on the extreme values of the data and that's values. We're just taking out and we are creating a distribution and that distribution, we call it as generalized extreme value. Okay. Now one theorem that can help you to find the parameters for the uh, distributions that you that you're going to be using okay what what could be the parameters and how can you identify all those things that approach is one of the approach that has been suggested is the fisher tippett theorem now this is one of the theorem here according to this theorem as the sample size n gets large as the sample size gets large the distribution of extremes the same thing uh, denoted by m subscript n converges to the following distribution known as the generalized extreme value distribution. And this is how it actually looks like. And here, 
the formula is is bit scary out here but not not to worry about it uh we don't have to remember this for the exam for sure but just understand what we are doing here so we are just calculating the cumulative probability so there are two things in statistics when i write capital f of x i'm talking about the cdf the cumulative distribution function and if i write this small or small case f of x i'm talking about the probabilities but they both denote the probability here it's a cumulative distribution and here either it's going to be pmf or the pdf that's the only difference here so what we are finding here is that what is a cumulative probability the, all the probabilities for the x okay for the random variable x given these three parameters that we're going to be using in a gev in a normal distribution we just have x follows a normal distribution that means they just have two parameters the mu and the standard deviation but here it's going to be three parameters there's going to be the gev the x follows uh, the the gev and what are the parameters here the mu the standard deviation and then this another symbol here okay so this this is the just the extra symbol that you have it here and that's these are the parameters here so given these values what is the probability or cumulative probability that is going to follow a gev distribution and this is the entire formula that you see here now there are two variations to it okay this is the first one this is the second one if you look at this if this symbol is not equal to 0 that means it has certain value obviously not equal to 0 means either it can be 1 2 3 anything but not 0 that's the first case so obviously you're going to have some you you'll plug in some values here and then you x minus mu this is like the the z value right in in normal distribution you have the z value formula this is nothing like that x minus mu divided by standard deviation so same thing here and then to the power 1 over divided by this once you solve this thing okay you will get a different answer which is going to be the cumulative probability for x same thing here cumulative probability for x given this thing but now this this symbol is considered to be zero so if this that is considered to be zero all you're left out is just with this particular thing here okay so that's that's what this thing is now if you look at these two things here the parameters the mu and the standard deviation they are the location so this is the location it helps you identify where is the center point that's the location and the scale parameter is how dispersed your data is how wide it goes so we have a wide angle camera like it goes this 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 similarly how wide the data goes that's the scale parameter although related to the mean and variance which we see in the central tendency they are ideally not the same and the symbol this is the tail index see gev focus focuses on what the tails so this is the tail index and indicates the shape or heaviness of the tail of the limiting distribution so you know what is a different parameter here obviously this is the different parameter and this parameter is known as a tail index it tells you how the tails will look like will it keep on increasing or will it not keep on increasing okay so that's what this thing actually talks about now there are three general cases of the gev distribution so if you as i said gev is like a it's like a tree and it has different branches okay so the first one is that if e is greater than zero so there are two cases here right if if it is not equal to zero that means either it's positive one two three four five six whatever the values are or negative negative one negative two negative three so on and so forth so if we consider that it is greater than zero obviously positive value the gev becomes a fresh air distribution now this distribution is named after a specific person who who find, found out this thing and the tails will be very much heavy as in the case of a t distribution and pareto distribution so you can just imagine if this value is let's say greater than zero maybe let's say one or two or whatever the number is then obviously your gev distribution it will look like a fresh a distribution I'll, I'll, I'll let you know how it looks like and the tails will be very much heavy as in the case of a t distribution and a pareto distribution so these are the two different distributions 
T distribution is something that we have already seen in level one and Pareto is something that we'll, we'll talk about. But very similar to these things, like a fat tails, that is what a fresh air distribution looks like. It will converge to that, okay? It will become like uh, this particular distribution. So this is what the second type of distribution would look like. That means if the Xi is zero, then the GeV becomes the Gumbel distribution. So another type of distribution, not to worry about it. Uh, as I said, more than 100 distributions. So yes, in level one, we just talked about 10 distributions to be specific. But here we have some other distributions as well. And the tails will be lighter, just like a normal distribution or a log normal distribution, what we expect on them. And then finally, if this tail index is less than zero, if it takes a negative value, then it becomes, the GEV becomes the Weeble distribution, Weeble, Weeble, whatever that you want to pronounce it. And the tails are lighter than the normal distribution. Obviously, if something is lighter than a normal distribution, we really do not bother, at least in finance. So the major concern for us is this first thing, that if this value is greater than zero, then it becomes a different distribution. So you know what, in this entire GEV distribution, if you look at it carefully, this value has a lot of importance, okay? Forget about the, the location and the scale parameter, but the tail index, it will determine the shape of the distribution, whether it goes to the extreme or not. That is what this thing is all about. So the identification of this value is very crucial. And it depends upon the analyst. Okay, I'll tell you how can you determine that. So distributions where this, the tail index is less than zero, that is the Weibull distribution, they do not appear in financial models. Therefore, the financial risk management analysis can essentially focus on the first two cases based on this particular thing. Now, it's very important whether your data, the tail index, it follows this zero or it follows a positive one. If it is either of these case, and spe specifically if it is a first one, then there are a lot of extreme values that is very much possible. Okay. So having an extreme values on either tails is very much possible. And we can expect that if this thing is here. Now, how do you identify that? The, the basic question is, okay, that this is so important. How do we identify that whether it's zero or not? So essentially we are saying, how do we select between a fresh air or a cumble distributions? That's what the question is now. If the researcher is confident of the parent distribution, that means if you look at the population data, how does it look? If you're confident, see, it's, it depends upon the an analyst or a researcher. So if the researcher is confident of the parent distribution, how does it look? And if the researcher has said that, okay, uh, it pretty much looks like a T distribution, for example, then the researcher should assume that, okay, it's a, it's a fat tail distribution. Then obviously the value for that would have been somewhere positive to, or uh, somewhere positive or greater than zero. That's what we can just identify, or we can just think about it. A second thing here is that maybe you're not confident about the parent distribution, no problems. You can apply a statistical test, a hypothesis, okay? And you can create a hypothesis that, okay, that this parameter is equal to zero, that's a null. And the alternative would be the, this, this is not equal to zero. Run a hypothesis test. If you fail to reject the null, if you fail to reject, which you actually want, right? Fail to reject. That means it's not statistically right to say accept the null, but for our purposes, you're understanding. Okay, let, let, let's say that we fail to reject or rather we accept it here. Then this is out. Then all that is left out here is this, which is a null. And we are concluding that E is equal to zero. The Xi is equal to zero. That's what we are concluding. That's the thing here. And if it is like this, pretty much you can take the approach of a Gumbel distribution and you, you do not worry, worry about the extreme values. Okay. But you know what? The, the statistical analysis can be 
you know, uh, it can be prone to some errors as well. There can be some model errors as well. So what if this analysis is wrong? What if, just think about it, your data is, is, is giving you a lot of extreme values, but your hypothesis has failed to reject the null. Now, this could be a contradictory situation and that could lead to, you're assuming that it's a Gumbel distribution, but it could turn out to be a fresh air distribution as well. So that's that's one of the things here. So the third point, it describes the same thing that given the dangers of model risk, obviously in this particular statistical test, and bearing in mind that the estimated risk measure increases with the tail index. So obviously the estimated risk measure will increase with the tail index. A safer option is always to choose the fresh air distribution. And the researcher may wish to be conservative and assume that it's equal to zeros to avoid any model risk. So understand if you if you calculate the var using this e greater than zero and this is less than zero, obviously there's going to be two different value at risk as well. So for this, which is greater than zero, you will have a var on the extreme because var focuses on the extreme quantile right? It's going to give you on the extreme quantile. So obviously the VAR is going to be very much higher, but if you have a Gumbel distribution where this is equal to zero, then obviously you have underestimated the VAR. You did not focus much on the extreme and obviously the value is going to be lesser than that as well. So that's one of the reasons why, and, and, and this is how we can actually select this particular thing. But what's the difference? What is the difference? Let's look it out here. If you notice here, there are two distributions that have, Weibull is absolutely, it's lighter than a normal distribution. So we did not uh, bring that up. But if you just look at here, here is the probability density and this is how the distribution looks like. So if you just focus here and if you just focus here, that this one, if, if that's something that ends here, okay? And this one. So this is a Gumbel distribution that you see here. And as you see that it's pretty much, if you, if you plot the mean here, it's pretty much, pretty much skewed, especially to the right skewed data. That's, that's what you see here. And let me just do it this way. Just a minute. And if you just see here, just concentrate on the Gumbel distribution. And you see that there is not a very much extreme values here, not, not very much extreme values, right? So if you just focus here, you just, you just see that, okay, this is a Gumbel distribution. It pretty much follows maybe less than two and less than six, pretty much decent. Okay. Because it's, it is zero, uh, still a lighter case, just like a normal distribution would look like, but this is pretty much not symmetrical. Like in a normal distribution, what happens? This is pretty much right skewed. But uh, still, it's decent. It, it covers a lot of things. But now, if you look at the fresh air distribution, the E is greater than this. This, this symbol is greater than zero. Then you see that it, it just goes on and on. The tails are very heavy. It just goes on and on up to this extreme value here. And even this thing is going to the negative side here. Okay. Uh, the gumbel stops here, but then it just keeps on going. And the gumbel stops at six. Okay. But then it just keeps on going. So it has positive values also. That means the chance of these values occurring is very likely when it comes to a fresh air distribution. And obviously if you calculate the VAR based on these two distributions that you have, this is going to underestimate if it is a fresh air and this will have a higher VAR values. Obviously the VAR is high. The expected shortfall would also follow the same thing here. So this is how you can understand, okay, and this is this is the distribution that it looks like for the GEV. Now, as I said, under the GEV, you have these three distributions. So G thing, and this is the specific thing here. Okay, the next approach that we need to focus on under the extreme values is that of a peaks over some threshold peaks over some threshold. Okay. So the peaks over threshold is it's, it's an approach, uh, is an application of extreme value theory to the distribution of excess losses over a very high 
threshold okay i'll i'll tell you the if you look at that particular diagram you will see that so the pot approach generally requires fewer parameters and that's the reason the simplicity is very much appreciated then approaches based on extreme value theorems like the fisher tippett theorem that we just saw the pot pot approach provides the natural way to model values that are greater than a high threshold so obviously what it does is it provides the simple and the natural way you can model the values that are greater than a specific threshold the, the higher threshold that you will just take and in this way it also corresponds to the gev theory by modeling the maxima or minima of a large sample so let's let's just understand this particular thing so if you look at the return on the snp 500 i've got the data from 19 you know 1950s or 60s to 2010 and Ideally, what happens here is that the, the POT approach, it pretty much focuses on the extreme values numbers. Okay. So maybe what I can do is the first thing that we, that we always do is we create a threshold. Like for example, if on this, you have a positive 10% return, negative 10% return. So let's say that anything. So the threshold is that, okay, as a portfolio manager, or as a manager, I can pretty much accept a threshold, a loss of, let's say, negative 10%. I can pretty much, I'm assuming that I can bear that loss. So I'm just going to create a threshold here. Okay. And then once I create a threshold, okay, which is, uh, which is what I call it as mu, okay, or this U, the, the symbol here that you see here, it's not actually mu, but yeah, the, over here, it signifies a threshold level. So I've created the threshold level here. and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow a, a maxima or a minima approach. Okay. So in maxima approach, what I can do is I can create the blocks here. Okay. For example, this, this, this block, I can, I can pretty much create that. And then similarly for, for another 10 years, I can create that for another 10 years, I can create that so on and so forth. I can create these blocks. Once I have all these blocks, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the values okay that are that are uh, uh, you know that is very that is very high or above the high threshold so this is a value that is higher than the threshold i'm going to note that down then this is the value very high negative 20 percent huge loss especially in the you know in the 1980s or, or early 1990s and then obviously this is the 2000 uh, over here 1998 and this is the 2007 and 2009 crisis right pretty much the extreme values here so what i'm going to do is i'm going to catch hold of these extreme numbers and that's what the overall thought process is okay so the pot approach is an application of extreme value theory to the distribution for the distribution of these values of excess losses over a high threshold that means if you have these excess losses if you create a distribution it's going to eventually correspond to the G gev but yes these are the values that you can just pick it up and if you just zoom it further or if you uh, now now obviously if if you want higher if you want more of these values you need to have uh, you know uh, maybe 5% should be the the threshold so depending upon you as the analyst what is a threshold amount that you can bear and so on and so forth. You will have more of these extreme values, more of these or less of these, depending upon the overall data that you have and the amount of that threshold that you actually choose. But hopefully you get a point as to what the POT approach actually focuses on. Okay. And that's what this thing does. You create a threshold level and you just pick up the maximum. Okay. So out of these maximum, which one is a maximum? You pick, pick that up the highest value, or maybe you can pick up the max minima approach as well. The minimum values and overall, that is also something that you can actually do it here, but this is a, just a described learning objective. So just focus what you've been asked here. So we define this mu or this U as a threshold value for the positive values of X and the distribution of excess losses over our 
threshold would be. So what is going to be the distribution that it's going to look like? So all the values that are above or beyond the threshold, this is what the formula will tell you. Now you don't have to remember this particular formula as well. So, but just understand what we are doing here. It's a conditional distribution formula and it makes complete sense. So this is a conditional distribution formula for X, given that the threshold is exceeded by no more than X. So if you just read through the formula, if you, it, it says that what is the, the cumulative probability for the random variable X, that is going to be the probability that is equal to the probability that X is some X, let's say this is X value is obviously it is above. So X minus mu is less than or equal to X given that X has exceeded mu, that X has gone above mu. Okay. And that's how this is the final, uh, this is the formula that it actually looks like. So the cumulative value for X plus mu, so X plus some plus this thing minus the threshold level divided by one minus the threshold level. So this is what the actual formula is. But all you need to know is that we are just, it's a conditional formula and it's a conditional distribution. Just like we have a probability that it is going to, the, the RBI will uh, raise the interest rate given inflation has gone up. So what is the probability for that? Same thing, given the, the threshold, or the X has exceeded the threshold, what is the cumulative probability that we can see those extreme values? That's what we are finding it here.